When I was young, I remember listening to my elders uh, telling me that knowledge is power. Learn, my child, uh, they used to say, knowledge uh, makes you smart and smart people have a chance to thrive in this world we inhabit. Their words uh, sounded uh, vague uh, to my callow ears. What is the knowledge uh, they're referring to? Knowledge of mathematics, uh, knowledge of physics, knowledge of languages, street knowledge, knowledge of human relationships. Unable to properly fathom uh, their ambiguous advice, I grew up to become a generalist. That is a person with a wide array of useful knowledge. I started uh, to think in systems and this mode of cognition led me to deeper states of consciousness that challenged uh, the way I interpreted uh, the world. I became more aware of my own existence, my own limitations and my own potential. And that's when it dawned on me. The elders uh, were right, but not right enough. In their quest for knowledge, they ignored uh, the true essence of what knowledge's purpose actually is. Knowledge is indeed power, but the path from knowledge to power is not immediate. There are stages one needs to follow and they could be summarized in the following sequence. Knowledge, awareness, control, power. Knowledge breeds awareness, that is, the consumption of knowledge leads to a collection of wisdom nuggets that, when properly construed, can raise awareness. Awareness is the ability of the individual to make sense of oneself and, consequently, of the world uh, around them. Once this process manifests uh, itself, one is able to transition from a state of cluelessness and incompetence uh, to a state of control and power. When I say power, I don't mean power over others, but power over the things you can control. And you can control only what you understand, what you are aware of. So the imperative word here is not knowledge, but awareness. Awareness is power and freedom, for awareness has always been the key to a life defined by clarity, intent and cohesion. There is a path uh, that one needs to follow in order to properly grasp uh, what awareness really is, and this path I endeavor to lay out today. When you're young, uh, the world around you feels overwhelmingly complex. You're thrown in this world uh, with no experience and sometimes with no support. You feel clueless and incompetent. Empirical investigation has led me to believe that the reason for this is twofold and has little to do with uh, intelligence. Two major forces that enforce this uh, circumstance, uh, so to speak, are the education system and the development of the frontal cortex. Let me elaborate. A brief history of how modern education came about reveals that, from the 17th century onward, the purpose of school was to create better workers, not better humans. Employers viewed school as a means to teach uh, future employees the rules of uh, punctuality, following directions, uh, tolerance for long hours of tedious work, and the minimal ability to read and write. On top of that, as nations became more centralized, national leaders saw a great chance in schooling to lay the foundations for the facilitation of future patriots and soldiers. In essence, the school was not a place where children could enjoy a holistic education and develop a healthy personality. It was more like a prison where they would eventually lose their identity, creativity and motivation. With regards to the frontal cortex, uh, prolific biologist Robert uh, Sapolsky revealed in one of his lectures uh, something groundbreaking. The frontal cortex is the last part of the brain to fully develop. Your frontal cortex is not fully developed until around age 25. That is astonishing. That explains an awful lot of behavior in freshman dorms. That explains all sorts of things. The frontal cortex takes forever to develop. And thus, childhood is filled with a frontal cortex that doesn't work very well yet. What does the frontal cortex do? All sorts of complicated things, regulating executive behaviors and strategizing on the very simplest level. What does the frontal cortex do? It makes you do the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. This is an astonishing finding and reveals two things. 
Number one, that uh, frontal cortex is predominantly sculpted uh, by environment and is least uh, constrained by genes, which apparently suggests that it is quite malleable. And number two, that young people don't have the capacity to totally benefit uh, from most of its uses until their mid-twenties. If we take into account uh, these two factors and combine them uh, with the proclivity of humans to usually choose the path of least uh, resistance when it comes to action taking, we find ourselves in a very unfavorable situation. We end up uh, with a huge amount of the population feeling not only clueless about who they are, but also lacking the necessary context uh, that would empower them uh, to discover their individual constitution. Nonetheless, uh, this stage is possible to overcome. Firstly, if the individual understands his or her limitations, and secondly, by methodically accruing knowledge uh, relevant to the alleviation of these uh, limitations. Patience is key here, and when coupled uh, with an incessant uh, tendency to question uh, conventional wisdom, it can produce extremely interesting outcomes. The famous maxim Know Thyself has been echoing throughout history since its first usage by Plato in his uh, dialogues. There are at least uh, six instances uh, during which Plato employs the maxim, and in every one of them he does so in order to stress out uh, the importance of self-discovery and the development of the individual. Although the context in each uh, instance is different, the rationale uh, remains the same. A self-aware individual is a conscious individual. Individuals who can't partake in the process of self-exploration will systematically fall victim to their own lack of awareness and the consequences that such a state causes. Some of the consequences include uh, confusion due to a lack of intent behind uh, decision-making, uh, frustration due to a lack of understanding why certain calamities occur in their lives, uh, hyperbolic emotional reactions when certain needs uh, remain unmet, manipulation by external agents that will try to present themselves as saviors and take advantage of the predicament uh, the individual faces. Essentially, a lack of self-awareness is the main source of dogmatism in society today. Humans will always seek uh, to belong and this lust uh, for tribalism can often yield uh, friction within society. Most people who cling to certain usually extreme ideologies do so because they haven't sorted themselves out. The absence of a strong individual identity destabilizes the substrate of their being and they're constantly in the look for more stable worlds to grab onto. These stable worlds can often be dogmatic worlds that reject certain aspects of reality in an attempt to deal successfully with its innately chaotic nature. Religions, political movements, cults, extremist groups all fall in that category and are there to remind us what a lack of self-awareness can engender. In a way, people who belong in these groups are manifestations of a person's inability to face uh, the concept of the shadow, as Carl Jung put it. The shadow is the unknown dark side of our personality. Dark because it is very obscure and also because we need to dig very deep within our psyche in order to discover it. It is a conglomeration of all of our fears, desires and impulses like sexual lust, power strivings, selfishness, greed, envy, anger or rage and it operates in a subconscious level. A person can never reach uh, the state of uh, self-actualization if they haven't uh, managed uh, to face the shadow until they can understand it, deal with it and eventually assimilate it. Plato also pointed out that understanding uh, thyself would also result to a greater understanding of the nature of being human. Namely, understanding uh, oneself would also enable a person to form an understanding of others as a result. In order to understand yourself, uh, first you need to understand your past and how your past uh, affects uh, your present and your future. The operative word here is past, um, but I use it to allude to both our past as individuals, but also to our past as uh, species. 
From an individual's perspective, uh, psychoanalysis is the most uh, pertinent uh, tool one can use to explore certain aspects uh, of their personality. Major events in our past have uh, played a critical role in shaping who you are today. Going back to those events, uh, facing them and creating uh, associations with current ones can significantly raise uh, self-understanding. From a species perspective, humans are a work of evolution in progress and our current state uh, can't be fathomed if we don't examine closely the practices and habits of our ancestors and draw parallels to current uh, behavioral uh, patterns. The complexity of our social fabric is an undeniable reality. We are idiosyncratic uh, creatures that perpetually try to balance between individuality and uh, togetherness. Usually we fail dramatically in that uh, attempt, but it doesn't always need to be this way. The way a person forms their understanding of social dynamics is fostered uh, during childhood and depends uh, largely on the way the upbringing uh, functions. Within the household, uh, a child can get a glimpse of how real society operates and adopt uh, certain characteristics that will help them uh, transition smoothly from the microcosm of their family to the wilderness of uh, the real world. Therein, uh, the child uh, develops an intuitive ability to interact and cooperate with others. Hence, most people make uh, judgments about others based on intuition. Intuition is indeed a powerful skill, but alone is not enough. It can offer a rough uh, understanding of social patterns, but if you want uh, to understand uh, the mechanics uh, deeply, you need to enhance your social skills uh, repertoire. In that respect, I'm going to briefly touch uh, upon uh, three major areas one needs to be aware of. Our perception is usually confined uh, within the limits that uh, our ego dictates. We are raised uh, to think individually and not syllogistically. That process seriously hinders our capacity to understand and cooperate with fellow humans and our ability to form mutually beneficial connections suffers uh, dramatically. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. It is a process that uh, leads uh, to a complete re-engineering of a person's worldview since it can offer them a completely new perspective on life. Cultivating empathy is the first step into unweaving uh, the mysterious uh, entanglement that encompasses our social life. Humans are evolved uh, primates with an extremely sophisticated uh, set of cognitive uh, tools. The way, however, our social structures are formed rely more on power uh, rather than sophistication. For years, uh, we have attempted uh, to evolve our societies from hierarchies to more egalitarian systems. For years, uh, we have failed uh, to do so. This reality is a result of an eclectic uh, amalgamation of reasons uh, such as cultural uh, differences, uh, environmental uh, influences, intelligence, uh, tribalism, religion, uh, nepotism, and the general lack of affinity towards uh, forming collective uh, views. It seems that, on average, our primitive mind uh, tends to dominate our more rational one, and the future doesn't look much promising in that respect. One needs to be aware of these truths and to exercise his or her capacity to deal with them uh, consistently in order to stay sane and competent in our power-oriented environment. The reason our species thrived and managed uh, to reach uh, this prosperous time in history is predicated upon our ability to cooperate and establish laws that will allow stability to prevail within our societies. These laws would have never existed in the first place if it weren't for the aptness of certain individuals to influence and persuade others to follow their ideas and causes. Influence and persuasion are two of the most ancient human arts and have shaped our social makeup uh, like no others. Yet uh, not so many seem to pay close attention to them. A heightened awareness cannot manifest itself with the absence of basic knowledge in influence and uh, persuasion. Not only does this knowledge uh, allow the individual to see behind uh, the scenes of reality, but it also offers uh, more clarity when dealing uh, with uh, the complexity of human nature. Such knowledge uh, shouldn't be clouded uh, by neglect.
Moving through the stages of awareness is a precarious process. One will inevitably reach a point where reality will become very different than before. The interpretation of patterns both within oneself and within others can result in an over-analytical mode of thinking and this over-analysis can more often than not be too much to handle. People transform from random entities that interact with you in an aimless fashion into intricate beings that reveal all their intentions and hidden agendas just by the way they move, talk and operate. Reality gets examined to the point of madness. This idea gained instant currency when I stumbled upon the writings of the infamous novelist Lajlo Krasnahorkai. This prodigious figure showcased his quintessential mind when he introduced us to a writing style so dense and tireless that felt like the ideal analogy to an over-analytical interpretation of the world. Here is a passage from the book War and War that illuminates what reality examined to the point of madness feels like. Because he didn't feel like going home to an empty apartment on his birthday, and it really was extremely sudden, the way it struck him that, good heavens, he understood nothing, nothing at all about anything, for Christ's sake, nothing at all about the world, which was a most terrifying realization, he said especially in the way it came to him in all its banality, vulgarity, at a sickeningly ridiculous level, but this was the point, he said, uh, the way that he, at the age of 44, had become aware of how utterly stupid uh, he seemed uh, to himself, how empty, how utterly blockheaded he had been in his understanding of the world uh, these last 44 years, for, as he realized by the river, he had not only misunderstood it, but had not understood anything. Anything about anything. I have been there many times. I assume that most of you have been there too. Your mind is trying to navigate your thoughts through this labyrinth of madness and you feel hopeless. You are afraid uh, you'll go crazy. Humans are not uh, designed uh, for this. We progressed uh, from a state of simplicity to a state of randomness and complexity quite abruptly. Technology allowed us to connect with each other and stretch our cognitive limits in unprecedented ways. We thought that we would improve every aspect of our experience, but in reality we started to lose our minds. Once you understand this, don't be hard on yourself. Don't fight it. Don't get mad. Don't despair. Don't worry about feeling uncomfortable. Instead, understand that feeling uncomfortable should be viewed as a virtue, not a hindrance. The key here is uh, to realize the necessity of this stage. View it the same way you view adversity and growth, since adversity is a necessary ingredient uh, of growth. Allow it uh, to train you and strengthen your mental uh, resilience, for it probably constitutes the most imperative stepping stone to reaching uh, what one so desperately desires, extreme self-awareness and extreme uh, self-ownership. Chaos, randomness, entropy and serendipity are all elements of disorder that engulf uh, the human experience. When dealing with them, people can be easily categorized into two groups, the ones that despair and the ones that accept. The first group will uh, constantly find reasons to complain, lament and allow reality to devastate them. The second group uh, will accept reality as it is, uh, understand uh, what they can control and eventually come up uh, with a strategy. Human nature is what it is. One cannot uh, change the world as a whole, but one can definitely change his or her world. That's the power of self-awareness and that's what the final stage of awareness mastery, so to speak, feels like. During that stage, uh, one should consider seriously the triad of pragmatism, anti-fragility and uh, search for meaning. Pragmatism allows us to see and speak the truth. We stop being delusional and we adopt a proactive stance towards uh, challenging uh, situations. The absurdity of this world uh, can be dealt with only when we stop idealizing circumstances and instead adapt uh, to the requirements of every circumstance. Anti-fragility is the word uh, that was missing from our vocabulary since the closest uh, we could get in describing things that withstand pressure is robustness. When Nassim Taleb introduced us to the term anti-fragile, our whole experience shifted gears. 
We didn't have to accept robustness as our ultimate option and we managed to move beyond that uh, to a state that actually gains from disorder. Finally, a lack of meaning uh, can lead to nihilism and although nihilism can be useful in certain cases, excessive adherence to it can lead uh, to chaos. Meaning brings structure and structure is the only antidote to the deleterious effects uh, of chaos. When I discovered uh, the five stages to awareness, it felt like a momentary vision, one of profound effect, and one to which my first response was to run off and to tell somebody about it. This video is perhaps a microcosm of my pursuit of self-awareness. It represents uh, the vital need uh, to confess my own unique experience and share it in all its immediacy with you. Hope you enjoyed it.